Well, happy Resurrection Day. Thank you. Same to you. Thank you. We call it Easter. That sounds kind of springy, and that's good. Uh, but I like it. it's what it really. Let's call it what it is. It's Resurrection Day. We want to celebrate that today. You go ahead and turn your Bible, uh, your copy of God's Word, to Matthew 28. And we'll kind of look at that in just a moment. Just to think about a few things uh, before we get going. I don't know if any of you knew what on kind of the church calendar, what yesterday is known as. We know uh, Friday is Good Friday, right? Do you know what Saturday is known as? Some of you might know. It's Silent Saturday. It's actually, we have it, we're, we're Christians. We have a name for everything, right? Uh, so, but that's the day. Think about it. It's the day between uh, Good Friday, which is the crucifixion of our Lord, and Easter Sunday. It was a Imagine an extremely difficult day for the disciples. I want you to just kind of think about that for a moment. Imagine what that was like for those who had followed him so faithfully, had served him and walked alongside him, had grown to love him, to watch all that he endured on Friday, the flogging and the crucifixion. And then many took his body and laid it in a tomb. And then Saturday came. That was a long day. It was the Sabbath. Uh, I'm not sure they felt like going to the synagogue that day. They probably just kind of were afraid to go anywhere. Most of the disciples we know were in hiding. Many of his other followers just probably trying to figure out what has gone wrong. What is going on? Why have we seen this? Why has this happened? Have you ever wondered about that in anything in your life? Why certain things happen the way they do? Imagine these early followers of Christ were feeling that same way with a lot of frustration, possibly some, maybe not full-blown despair, but at least some some angst and some, some pain and trying to determine where, where do we go from here? This, this wasn't the plan that we had. We thought he was the Messiah. We thought we were going to get to follow him. This was going to be great. I mean, remember last week? Last week we were all coming into Jerusalem. It was excited. People were cheering and screaming. And by Friday they were cheering and screaming to kill him. And Saturday was a long day. But Sunday came. Out of the midst of all of that that they had experienced, Sunday came. So go ahead, if you would, in honor of reading God's Word with you. Stand with me as we look at Matthew 28. I'll bring this thing around real quick. That's all right. Matthew 28, verses 1 through 15. As we look at Matthew's account of the resurrection here. And, and he writes, he says, Now after the Sabbath, it began to dawn toward the first day of the week. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to look at the grave and behold, a severe earthquake had occurred, and an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone and sat upon it. And his appearance was like lightning, and his clothing as white as snow. And the guard shook for fear of him and became like dead men. And the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he was lying. Go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going ahead of you into Galilee, and there you will see him. Behold, I have told you. And they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to report to the disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and greeted them. And they came and looked, took hold of him, his feet, and worshiped him. Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go take my word, take word to my brethren to, who live in Galilee, for there they will see me. Now while they were on their way, some of the guard came into the city and reported to the chief priest all that had happened. And when they had assembled with the elders and consulted together, they gave them a large sum of money to the soldiers and said to them, You are to say his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. And if this should come to the governor's ears, we will win him over and keep you out of trouble. And they took the money and did as they had been instructed. And this story has been widely spread among the Jews and is to this day. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for how you speak to us. This uh, event that we celebrate today in so many ways. This shapes who we are as followers of Christ. This is the reason we are gathered today and every Sunday for that matter. It changes the world in which we live. It changes our focus. And Father, I pray you would use me as your vessel to faithfully communicate your word to your people today that we might be reminded of the great truth of the resurrection and what that means to our lives. Thank you, Lord, for loving us in spite of us. And thank you for achieving victory over our greatest enemy, death. We celebrate you today, for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. You know, after all that they went through, through that weekend, they come to the tomb on Sunday. And you know, what were they coming to the tomb for on Sunday morning? To anoint the body, to prepare. They had some herbs and stuff. I don't know if you understand in those days, they didn't do a lot of the procedures for embalming that we do today. And after a while, 
when a human body, after it has died, it starts to do some things and it doesn't smell so good. And so they were going to, and they would often cover that up with all the different aromas, the different ointments and, and things that they would place upon the body to help it slow the decay and also to help it basically just cover up the smell. And that was part of what they did. And they waited till Sunday because Saturday was the Jew holy day, Sabbath, and they would do nothing on Saturday. So they had stayed in home, but obviously too, they were probably hiding from the Romans and others wondering what was next. In fact, we don't see the disciples mentioned in this. They don't go to the tomb with the women. It is just a few of the women that are going to the tomb to perform this task. It must have been a lonely march up that road as they walked along there, as they were trying to get to where they were going and they knew what awaited them. And then it was a different kind of scene than they expected when they got there. Have you ever gone somewhere expecting something and you weren't looking forward to getting there and then when you got there, it was completely different? Sometimes in a bad way, but in this situation, it was a good way. Well, that's what had happened to them. They were, they were preparing themselves to do what they really didn't want to do, but knew they needed to do. And they were all the, all the pain and all the hurt that was going on. And they were just trying to get through this circumstance that they had endured. And they come to the tomb. And the scriptures tell us that there had been an earthquake and the stone had rolled away. Their angels had come and Jesus came out and the soldiers fainted like dead men. It was quite a scene. And there's a few little details we're going to look at here that kind of, I think, are a reminder to us of some deeper things. Because oftentimes, it's in those small details in the Scriptures that we see things that we don't always catch. You ever notice that? So when they come and they see, where is the angel in the text? Is he floating up? You know, right? No? Where is he? He's seated on top of the stone like a conquering hero. Seriously, you see the image? Look at the image. He's seated on the stone. The stone has been removed. It is no longer the barrier between Jesus' burial place. And basically, the seal that had been placed on there by the Romans, that stone was to say, you don't go in here. And they put a seal on saying, no one goes in here because people often did that to steal from graves. And this armed guard that is surrounding the tomb seems kind of strange. I've been to the cemetery over here quite a bit, you know, Mount Olivet, I've never seen armed guards around any of the graves. Have you? The only place I know where there are armed, gods, armed guards is the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, right? Other places we don't have armed guards in cemeteries or where there are dead bodies. We just don't because generally when someone's dead, they're not coming out, right? That's the way it works. But in this case, they were so afraid that the disciples would steal his body and then they'd say he was resurrected and there was all this that was going to happen. They said, we've got to stop this, so would you just put an armed guard around the tomb? Can you imagine what it was like to get that detail? Think about that for a minute. Those of you, I know some, many of you in this crowd have been in the military and you get a lot of different challenging details, but your detail is, okay, you're going to go guard a tomb. Okay, why? Well, they're afraid somebody's going to steal the body, so we're going to sit there by a dead guy's tomb and we're going to sit there all night, right? That's pretty much the plan, guys. Yeah, that's what we're going to do. And so they do it because they're soldiers. They do what they're told to do, and that's what they do. And they go to guard the tomb, and they experience something they have never experienced before. Now, I often wonder what it was going on that morning in the tomb. Don't you? This is where I'd love to have seen what takes place from inside this dark tomb. Because you know it's a cave, basically, and when they shut the stone over it, it's just what? Dark in there. And Jesus' body is laying there on this slab, probably, and just laying there covered up in the burial shroud. It's over. It's cold. It's dank. And then something happens. I, I, I don't know what happened. I wasn't there. But I can imagine, as I think about it, when the power of God, the resurrection power of the God of God, the, the one and only God, our Lord, begins to work and move and resuscitate and bring his son's body back to life. Can you imagine what that was like? Think about that for just a moment. Let that sink in, that, that, that power, what that came like. Was it a light? What was it that came in? And suddenly, this body that was dead, I mean dead. Not, he, wasn't in, he wasn't asleep. He wasn't kind of woozy. He was dead because the Romans were really good at a few things. And the thing they were probably best at as we look at antiquity and history was crucifying people. They were really good. They had a lot of practice. They had done it a lot, and they knew how to do it, and they knew how to make sure you were dead. That was part of the role. 
And so Jesus was completely dead. 100% stone cold dead. Can I get any clearer than that? Not a pulse, nothing. He's not alive. He's out. And then comes the power of God. The same power that by his word brought life into dust of the earth that was man and made man a living soul. You remember that in Genesis? That brought everything that we know into existence by the power of his word. That same one that has that power now speaks the word, breathes the breath of life back into his dead son, and suddenly we see the power. We, we don't get to see it. We begin to experience this. I can imagine this immense light of the power of God radiating in that dark tomb. He begins to breathe. And Jesus gets up. Now there's an interesting detail here that I had missed a lot of times, and I've read this passage a lot, and I read someone else's account of it, and I thought it was really worth sharing because I thought it was a really interesting detail. If you notice, it talks about the burial cloths are just lying there, except for the face covering. It mentions in, in John's gospel. I don't know if it mentions it here, but it's, it's folded up neatly and laid there on the slab. Now, why would you do that? I guess for Jesus, you can do what you want. You know, maybe you remember Mary telling him to clean up his room, make his bed. I don't know. It's a joke, okay? I don't think that's what he did. But there's a very interesting Arabic-Palestinian custom that has to do with supper. Now, most of us, when we have napkins, you know, unless we go to a fancy restaurant, our napkins are paper, and what do we do with them when we're done with them? We throw them in the trash. But oftentimes, they're cloth napkins, and you've probably experienced this when you go to a restaurant. A lot of times, I'll have those. And one of the things that you do to signify you are done is you wrinkle, kind of wad your napkin up and just lay it there on the table. But if you fold your napkin up neatly and lay it on the table, that is a sign to those that are serving you, you're not done, you'll be back. So when Jesus folded up the, head, the facial covering there that was over him neatly and laid it there, was that not a symbol, a sign to us that he will be back? I believe it is. And I take great comfort in that reality and knowing that all of this is it's just a little detail, but just of the way that he wanted to make sure that everybody understood what was going on. And you notice what the angel said to the women. Did you catch that? He just saying that he's not here, he's risen. And then what does he tell them? Well, he tells them to go tell, but what does he tell them to do first? Remember? Come and see. Look in the tomb here. Take a look inside. Not something I plan on doing often. I don't really relish that idea, but he says, come and see. Why? Because he's not here. We want you to see it. We don't want you just to tell. Don't tell everybody just what I tell you. I know I'm an angel and I got a lot of authority here, but I want you to see this. Do you understand this? The angel wants them to see with their own eyes. And they see with their own eyes the tomb is empty. Now, obviously, it says also in that text that they were struck with fear. I can imagine if I saw an angel of God sitting on top of a tomb, you know, on top of a big rock like that, I would... Fear might be one of the emotions uh, that would come across my life. I mean, remember, it tells us earlier that the soldiers that were guarding the tomb did what? They fainted like dead men. Now, to scare a soldier, I would think, takes a lot. A lot. But these men of war, these men who were called to do this job, see something that they had not seen before that scares them so much that they literally faint out of fear. They're overwhelmed. And these women, they were given this task then to go and share with the disciples what they've seen. And they're a little afraid, but they're excited at the same time. And in Mark's gospel, that's how it ends. It ends with them talking about fear and, and what to do. Because there is that, you know, okay, is this really happening? Or is this some kind of illusion? What's going on here? I mean, Jesus isn't here. We know he's not in the grave. He's gone. What's going on? And that happens to us sometimes as we try to see the greater, bigger things in life. Sometimes things are unbelievable to us, aren't they? They're hard for us to grasp. And maybe in that moment for these women, it was hard to really grasp what had happened, but then it begins to sink in. And I love John's gospel and his account of this, which we looked at last year. You may not remember. You probably slept since then. I just remember because I know what I preached last year. Where John, you know, when Mary is kind of leaving the garden, and who does she meet on the way out? Jesus. And he talks to her, and they have a conversation, and she doesn't realize it's Jesus for the longest time until he does what? Until he says her name. And then she gets it. 
You see, this is how it begins. This is really the beginning of our faith. It doesn't start in Bethlehem. It really begins here at the tomb. And what an ironic and strange place for the birth of the Christian faith to truly begin. Because this is when we begin to see that Jesus is more than a man. Everything Jesus said about himself is validated as true by this event. That's why some have tried to discredit and say, oh, it, it didn't happen. And, and I love all the excuses. There's all kinds of theories out there that tell us about the resurrection. You know, one of them is the, one of my favorites is the swoon theory, that he wasn't really dead. He was kind of like really just almost comatose, and then he woke up. Did I not mention to you how good the Romans were at killing people in crucifixion? Do you realize how much blood loss Jesus experienced just through the crucifixion? And then they stabbed him in the side to make sure he was dead. And all the blood and water came. I mean, it was a, he was a mess. There was nothing left in him. He was dead. So that theory is just crazy. Another one I love is that they went to the wrong grave. Where do people come up with these kind of things? Do you ever wonder about that? How do they sit around and think, we've got to figure out a way to make this not work? which makes no sense that they went to the wrong group. I think they knew where they were going. They had just taken him there a couple days before. They knew where they put him. They weren't crazy. They understood where they were going. And so they were at the right grave. That doesn't make any sense. There are a lot of different excuses that people come up with, but I want to share with you just a, a few thoughts about the resurrection, some, something I read that you may have heard before, just some evidences of the, of the resurrection, some things that should help encourage us about this, and I'm just going to share a few of them. There's several of them out there, but I mean, Jesus himself said that he would die and be resurrected. Do you not you remember that? He, his say, he told the disciples this would happen. He said, I will be lifted up. I will be crucified. He didn't say crucified. I will die, but in three days, I'll be, I'll be back. It won't keep me down. I will die, but I will return. He reminded them. He personally told them that several times. The tomb was empty. This is a truth that nobody in antiquity argues with. If the tomb was not empty, at that time, they could have said, okay, you crazy disciples and people, here's the body of Jesus. It's all a joke. You were mistaken. Here it is. That never happens. The tomb was empty. So we've got that. We, we have another, another fact, just one more I'm going to give you here, and then just, just to think about one of the most powerful evidences of the resurrection to me is the transformation in the lives of the disciples. Where were the disciples on Saturday? And mostly Friday, for that matter. Do you know where the disciples were? Most of them were in hiding. I do not blame them. If I had been one of them, I'd have been right there with them. Because, you know, if they kill your leader, what's probably going to happen to you? It's not good. And they understood that, and they were in hiding for fear of their lives. So as they're hiding to stay away, what, you know, they don't know what to do. They're, they're afraid. You know, what Jesus said he was the Messiah. He said it was this, but what, what's going on here? This doesn't make any sense. And then something changes in them. These same men that were hiding in a room that Jesus had to go find, right? We'll see, that's in another text. When he goes and visits them, they're, they're all cowered. They're, in, they're up in the upper room, the last place they'd been with him, and they're all, and the doors are all shut. The windows are sealed. Nobody knows they're in there. And Jesus just shows up. I love that. Just shows up doesn't knock. He just comes in and starts talking to him. And I love what he says. Peace be with you. Shalom. Here we go. Hey guys, how's it going? Hello. And they don't know what to do. They don't know how to react. Of course, Thomas is missing and that's a whole other story. And I, I, you know what? I, for one, am thankful for Thomas, but we don't have time to get into Thomas today. We'll just, we'll come back to that maybe some other day. But as we as we think about all that they experienced, and suddenly these, these men that were cowards, these men that were afraid, these men that were in hiding, are suddenly running around the streets of Jerusalem, the very city where they crucified Jesus, and they're telling people that Jesus is alive and he is the Son of God, and they're preaching the gospel boldly, without fear, knowing what awaits them. They don't care anymore. What causes that kind of change? Here's one more for you. Just This is a freebie, okay? How many of you... Look in the back of your, how many of you have the book, good book of James in your Bible? I hope you do. If not, you better check your Bible. It's in the New Testament. It's toward the back, the book of James. You don't have to find it. It's there. You can look in the table of contents. It's there in the book of James. You know who is, the book of James is supposed to be written by. Not James the apostle, but James the half-brother of Jesus. He is known as James the elder. 
one of the early leaders, he and Peter were probably two of the key leaders in the early first century church. And if you go and look in the, in the Gospels as well, you'll see kind of an encounter with Jesus and some of his, his uh, siblings. I guess they'd kind of be half-siblings, right? Because their father, God was not their father. Be, Joseph was their dad. But anyway, they think of some things about their brother that are kind of different. They think their brother's crazy, first of all. They say that. They're not sure. And James was one, it's known in antiquity, as it's taught, was somebody who thought his brother was a little bit goofy. And then something changed James's opinion. Something radically impacts his mind, his heart, his life, and suddenly he no longer sees his brother as his brother. He sees his brother as the son of the living God, the Messiah. What causes a change like that? Resurrection will do it. Resurrection changes a lot of things. And the same is true for us as followers of Christ. The resurrection changes everything. Now, some have said it's not true, and we basically have two points of view. It is either true, and we should, we should celebrate that, and we should then understand that everything that Jesus said is true as well, okay? It's a two-sided coin. It's good news. It's exciting, but also realize the teachings of Jesus, all the things he said about himself, all the things he commanded us to do, all those things apply completely. Now, we better understand who the authority is if he is resurrected, and I believe he is resurrected. That's why I'm here. If he's not, then we are fools. Pity to be, as Paul says, we are to be pitied among all men if the resurrection is not true. But Paul's another one. Oh, we didn't talk about him, did we? You remember who Paul saw on the way to Damascus? What was Paul about to do? See, Paul didn't like Christians. He was known as Saul at the time, by the way, Saul of Tarsus. He was a very, uh, but pretty much in the Jewish leadership, and he was trying to stamp out this group they called the way, these followers of Christ that were starting this cult in Jerusalem, and he wanted to stop them. And so he was given the opportunity and given papers to go out and break them in, bring them into prison. They could have them imprisoned or killed, and that was his job. And if he couldn't get them to prison, he could kill them. That's fine. They didn't care. And he's on his way to do this on the road to Damascus, on his way to do this and find some Christians and bring them into prison. And on the way there, he meets someone he does not expect. And we looked at this a few months ago in Acts. And that someone he meets is the very one he saw sought to persecute. And Saul of Tarsus, probably the greatest enemy in, the, in that time to the gospel. You understand, the, the scope of this conversion of this man would be like if Osama bin Laden came to Christ, literally. I want you to understand that. This man was a hater of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And suddenly he becomes its greatest evangelist and missionary. A good large portion of the New Testament is written by him. Every one of us in this room, unless we are Jewish, are here because of the witness and testimony of the Apostle Paul. Because he first took the gospel to those who were not of, the Jewish, uh, of Jewish heritage. He took it outside of the boundaries of Israel to the rest of the world. That was his role. That was his job. That was his calling. And because of his faithfulness, I'm here. I'm a believer because of what he did. And that's another evidence of the resurrection. There's so much evidence for what takes place. So many things about this. But one of the most powerful things to me that of all these things we've, we've talked about, and you're probably thinking, when is this guy going to be quiet? The most amazing thing to me about the resurrection is how it changes me. And I'm not talking about life after death, and that's good, but it helps me understand a deep truth that I kind of know but now know in ways I never knew before. Let me explain myself, because you're looking at me like, what, has he, what in the world is he talking about this morning? Jesus said on numerous occasions that he is the Son of God. He even, in which is to basically declare himself equal to God the Father. And he even declares himself more than one occasion as one being equal with the Father, with God. Now that was pretty much heresy, unless it's true. That'll get you stoned in that part of the world unless it's true. And they tried to stone him and weren't able to do it. Jesus declared that, and he said that. And then he had said all these other things about himself. And then he was humiliated, tortured, crucified, and he was dead, and it looked like it was over. And then 
everything changes. There's an old movie about the life of Jesus. There's a lot of old movies about the life of Jesus. And I honestly can't remember which one it is, but I love its ending better than any other because it simply ends with this pan into the tomb. And the tomb is empty, and then it pans to the wall, and it says, the beginning. See, the tomb usually is the end. You thought about that? The cross, like this symbol that is behind me, which is a very nice, ornate one, nothing like the one Jesus was crucified on, is usually a sign of the end. It's a sign of death. It means it's over. You're finished. They're through. There's nothing more to do. That's it. The cross takes no prisoners, and neither does the grave. It keeps everybody except one. There's one who only spent a short time there. It's kind of like the t-shirt I saw, and you've heard me share this. Too bad I'm going to share it again anyway, because it's Easter, and I just love sharing it. I was at a youth camp many years ago, and a girl had a t-shirt on that I wish, I don't think I could find it anymore, because it was, looked kind of not well done, and, but it was a great message. It had pictures of people on the front. She had like a picture of, uh, I think there was a picture of Buddha. There was a picture of Grant, Ulysses S. Grant, uh, George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, some other people. And in what it said on the shirt, what do all these guys have? What does Jesus have in common with all these guys? And it said, he had a tomb but he only needed it for the weekend. <laughs> Think about that. Just a temporary reside. It literally was temporary. The, the grave ordinarily is not like that except with Jesus. It couldn't hold him. Just as sin could not restrain him and stop him from what he had to do, he did what he needed to do for our sakes, for our salvation, for our deliverance. He accomplished everything on the cross, and then it was validated in God's ultimate saying, this is my beloved son, watch what I'm going to do now. Bam! I don't know how it happened, that just, bam, sounds good. I like him of God, so we're going to say, bam, that's it. And here he comes, out of the tomb. I like that, up from the grave he arose, I like that. You know, it kind of has a bounce to it. Everything in a moment changes. And it validates everything about what he said. My Savior told me a lot of things through the word of God. And he told you too, didn't he? We read about all of his teaching. We read about the insights that he had, his, his desire for us, his purpose for our, and plan for our lives, and also our condition. See, why does Easter matter? Easter matters for a lot of reasons, but the main reason Easter matters to me, is it reminds me also why Good Friday matters. Good Friday was necessary for me. See, there's, there's a separation between us and God before Christ. Do you know that? It's kind of like a chasm, like a canyon. You ever been to a canyon? I've never been to the Grand Canyon. I've been to the Snake River Canyon, which I think is kind of interesting because I'm a kid of the 70s and you probably have no idea who Evil Knievel is, but a couple of us do in the room. And he once made an ill-fated jump that was in Montana, actually, over the part of the Snake River Canyon, and it didn't go so well for him. He, had a, he called it a motorcycle, but it looked more like a rocket ship. And he stood it on this ramp, and then he shot it over, and it kind of fizzled along the way. And fortunately, the parachute, it was kind of a mess. It didn't go well. But I can't imagine getting across a canyon without some assistance, without a bridge, right? Well, imagine a canyon that is broader than anything you can imagine. I mean, just think, think about the ocean. You ever seen the ocean? I hope you have. It's not far away. Imagine the ocean like a canyon. How do you get across the ocean? You fly or you get in a boat, right? They cannot build a, a bridge across the Atlantic Ocean, right? It's too big. Can't get there on your own. You could try to swim across, but I don't care if you're Michael Phelps, you're not making it. And Michael Phelps is an amazing swimmer, okay? He's amazing, but I think he'd agree with me. He would want to try that. I mean, the English Channel's one thing, but the Atlantic Ocean took Lindbergh a few days to get there in an airplane. You imagine how long it takes to swim across that thing? It's not happening. And yet we think we can get from here. And the chasm between us and God makes the Atlantic Ocean look like a puddle. It's nothing. It's absolutely nothing. There is a, no way we can get to where God is. The, the canyon is impossible. There's no, it's just an impossible feat to get there. We try. 
We go to church. We try to be good. We try to do all the right things. We try to appease other people or think we're making God happy by doing all these wonderful things, but it's not doing any good. Isaiah says our, our good deeds are filthy rags in God's sight. They don't mean anything to God. And God knows this, always has. From the very beginning, before we were ever made, he knew there, needed to be a, there was a plan. This is not a backup plan. This is the plan. And that plan was to make a way for us. And that way is Jesus Christ. He is the only way. Not being a Baptist or a Presbyterian or Methodist or a church member gets you into heaven. The only thing that gets you to, to God is Jesus. Are we clear on that? I mean, it's all about Jesus. It's all about trusting him. He is literally that bridge. He is that walkway. He is the only way, as he says in John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through who? Me, he says. Jesus is the only way. It's pretty simple. And the resurrection so validates that. It also reminds me of my mortality. The day will come, no matter how many miles I run and how hard I try to stay fit, when this ticker says I'm done. It's going gonna, it's gonna to quit. Nothing I can do about it. And the same is true for everybody in this room, right? It's a universal truth. We cannot escape it. We try really hard, but we will not. We, now we don't think about it, but it's a reality. So what ne- what's then? What's next? Jesus tells us what's next. He says, I've come to give you life more abundantly. Remember he talks to the woman at the well in that conversation, you know, the person who drinks this water will never thirst because I give you a water that will spring up to you a well of living water, change you. And then he says in that, and he's talking with Nicodemus in John 3. Remember what he says? They're having these conversations and you know, Nicodemus trying to figure out, how, how do we know what's going on? How can we figure it out? I, and, and what does Jesus say in that verse 16 that every Preschooler knows, and every kid in the one I know knows. For God so what? Loved the world that he did what? He gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have what? Think about that for a minute. That was the purpose. That's the purpose of what we're looking at today. That's what the cross was about. That's what the resurrection is about. It's about the hope of life eternal. Jesus reminding us, death does not keep me down. I'm coming back. I told you so. And he did. And they were surprised when they saw him because they saw him die. And if I'd been standing there too watching Jesus be crucified and all the horrors, I'd have been surprised too to see him come back because I don't know anybody ever come back from that. You don't come back from that. You can come back from a beating, but you don't come back from crucifixion. Death, death holds no prisoners. It's, it's, not, it's, it's over. When it gets you, you're done. You're finished. And yet Jesus overcame that. And that's, a, that's something for all of us to hang on to, isn't it? This life is not all there is. Death is not the end. Because of what our Savior has done, there's so much more. More than we realize, more than we imagine. And literally... When you become a follower of Christ, life actually really begins. Everything you're doing before that is okay, but being a follower of Christ changes your perspective. It changes everything because you begin to see life from his perspective and his point of view. So within light of all that I've shared, which is probably more than you wanted to hear, but that's too bad, what do you do with that? What do you do with Jesus? I mean, we, we gather together today, and it's, it's wonderful to see you all here today. It's, it's, it's really nice to look out across and not see so many pews. I love it. Instead of seeing, I like seeing faces. And every one of us are here today for a reason. And we all have our thoughts and minds on what those reasons are that we're here. And I'm going to tell you something. I have no idea why you're here. I know it wasn't to come hear me preach. I'm pretty sure that's one thing I'm pretty confident in. But I believe God has a reason for you to be here today. And from before you were even a, 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 a twinkle in your daddy's eye, before you even a thought, before you ever came to be, God knew this day was going to happen. Did you know that? 
and he knew you were going to hear a message, and he knew you were going to hear some things from his word, and he had a specific word for you. And you may have heard me say a lot of words today, but there's something today that's sticking in your crawl, spiritually speaking. Not a word you expect to hear on Easter morning, was it? But it's reality. Because sometimes stuff just kind of gets stuck there in our spirit, and we're kind of like, what do I do with that? And we kind of like, I got to do something with it because it's, it's bothering me. Maybe today is that day for you. It's a lot of things you can deal with, a lot of important things you can deal with in life, but there is nothing more important than what Jesus dealt with by his life and his ministry and what he demonstrated on that Sunday. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. Absolutely nothing. Paul says it well in the scriptures. And he goes through the list of things, not death, not life, not angels, not principalities, not, nothing you can imagine. And what a great example of how death does not separate us from God's love when our Savior comes back from the grave. He is alive. And we say that a lot as Christians, and there's a lot of banners behind me saying that, right? And that's good that we say it, but do we believe it? Really? Do we really believe he's alive? If so, it changes how we live, doesn't it? One thing I want to close with, that's what preachers say, and you say, then they go 10 more minutes, right? Time me. He loves you more than you can imagine. And what we talked about last week and what we celebrate on Good Friday is the demonstration of that love. The cross is the demonstration of just how far God is willing to go to make you his kid, to adopt you into his family. That's how much he loves you. And the resurrection is the reminder to all of us that God always keeps his promises. He always accomplishes his desires because he's God. And then he leaves it up to us. He doesn't force himself on us. He doesn't twist our arm. He doesn't make us do what he wants us to do. He lets us choose his purpose, his will for our lives, or choose our path, our will, our purpose for his life, our purpose for our lives. And then live with the consequences. Maybe today he's calling you to follow him. Maybe you've already taken that decision. Maybe you did that years ago and that, that's done, done with that preacher, but maybe your life hasn't matched up to that. I don't know. I'm not the Holy Spirit. Don't pretend to be. But I want you to think about where you are in your pilgrimage with Christ. Are you where God wants you to be? Or maybe is it time for you to take another step of faith to be the man or woman of God God is calling you to be? To trust him completely with your life? Because he can handle anything. I mean, if he can come back from the dead, what can he not do? Think about that. I mean, he is God. And for that fact alone, I am amazingly thankful and abundantly grateful. Would you pray with me, Father? I thank you for your word. I thank you for what we celebrate today, what it means to us as followers of Christ, and what it means to our world, that we are reminded fully and completely that Jesus is exactly who he claims to be. And everything he said, his word is truth. Now what I have to do is decide what am I going to do with that? How am I going to respond to that? Or am I simply going to just think, oh well, that's nice. Oh, Father, it's so much bigger than that. Draw us unto yourself to accomplish what only you can. Use this time in whatever purposes you have planned for in the hearts and lives of these people that are gathered here today. For us, this is in the name of Jesus, our Savior, our risen Lord, our hope, our everything. Amen.